to a Google Hangout where we're going to discuss the US presidential elections and what some are calling the Trump phenomenon. For the first time at a Waikato University Hangout, we've got all the panellists in the same room and that certainly should make it easier for lively discussion and a bit of verbal biffo even. I'll quickly introduce you to the panel, give you their credentials. On my right we have Dan Zerker. He's a professor of political science and his research interests and expertise include corruption in developed and developing democracies, ethnicity and state, the dynamics of democracy and mass politics, Latin and American and African Latin American and African politics, US politics, and the US in international relations. This is Professor Linda Johnston. Linda's overall research interests centre on challenges and spatial complexities of inequality. Specifically, her work draws attention to the exclusionary ways in which various forms of marginalisation, I've just lost my place, and discrimination such as sexism, homophobia and racism shape people's places and spaces. Dr. Ruben Steff is a lecturer in political science and public policy. Dr. Steff has worked for the New Zealand Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade in the International Security and Disarmament Division, where he worked on counter-terrorism and transnational crime issues, and then in strategic policy. His expertise is in globalisation, international relations and international security, and US and New Zealand foreign policy. And at the far end of the table is Associate Professor Eva Collins from the Department of Strategy and Human Resource Management, where she teaches business, government and strat society. She was a lobbyist for 10 years, working with the US Congress and White House on environmental trade and civil aviation issues, the United Technologies Corporation. Eva continues to follow US politics avidly and still has many contacts in the thick of DC. So she will be helping me ask the questions today. And also I'd just like her to outline the situation, the big picture stuff, just to get the ball rolling. Okay. Thanks, Ali. So uh, um, big picture, what we're headed to is um, we, we're down to really four major candidates, two on the Republican side, two on the Democratic side. Um, on the Republican side, we have Donald Trump, uh, and we have Senator Ted Cruz from Texas. Uh, on the Democratic side, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, and um, Bernie Sanders, Senator Sanders from Vermont. Uh, and the, we're headed into the conventions that will happen in July. And um, as an expat living in New Zealand, this is a primary, we were talking uh, uh, before we started about whether globally the primaries have been followed as closely as they have this time internationally. And I have to say this is the first time I've been stopped in the street at the primary level by taxi drivers, by if I'm at the grocery store, and the predominant question is, how has Trump gotten this far? Uh, everybody wants to know that. So um, it's it's um, it's a particular mood in the states. Uh, Washington posted an article about how Trump got to be so popular, and they came down to four um, reasons. And first is he keeps it simple. It's not always right, but his statements are are simple. Um, he's tapping into some concerns about immigrants that people have, uh, and third, he is anti-establishment, and I would say that's a theme that I'm seeing throughout, because I've never really considered Senator Sanders as, as a, a stalwart of the Democratic Party as well. Mm -hmm. So um, there's there's that issue. Uh, and um, the fourth one is he's saying things that people have been afraid to say, but have been thinking all along. So Dan, it would be helpful mm -hmm. uh, if you agree with my big picture uh, um, outline and, and what you think is going on at this time. No, I, I agree entirely, Eva. I think that uh, Virtually every presidential candidate runs as anti-establishment and as an outsider. Anti-Washington is probably a better, mm -hmm. a better description. But I think in this case, he has been able to benefit from strategies that usually discount a candidate early on. And that, I think, owes a lot to his populism. Mm -hmm. He is using what is we sometimes call demagoguery, uh, building up emotions over issues that usually would turn people off. And uh, I think it is a reflection on the age, a reflection on the time. Um, 
he is somebody who can claim uh, directly that we're giving jobs away to China. And then when he's confronted by David Letterman with one of his own products that is made in China, say, oh, not a problem. This is just something that I do and not suffer the consequences. Now, I think that is a reflection on selective viewing. And I think when people begin to view selectively as they are, they are essentially victims. They feel themselves to be victimized. And this is an age in which many people are victimized. There is a best-selling New York Times book from the early part of this century called What's the Matter with Kansas? And it is an exploration of why so many humble people are voting against their own immediate interests in places like Kansas. It began looking at Obamacare, and which Obama likes that title, so I'll use it. Uh, they were outraged. They went to um, these town hall meetings that President Obama held over his health care, outraged that he would disrupt their sacred relationship with their doctor, knowing somewhere in the back of their minds that they didn't have the money for a doctor, but had somehow been influenced to the point where they thought their rights were being taken away from them. And I think that that is a reflection on the age. And, yeah. I, and, and Donald Trump is definitely a, um, a symbol of how people are feeling. And the, the more, you know, it, as you're saying that he's attacked, and the more he's attacked, for some people, the more that's evidence that he's an anti-establishment, and, and it, it increases his credentials instead of decreases his credentials. There's that, and there's also the, a little bit of something else, which I think we have to remember is goes back to the founding of the United States. One of the plans for the Constitution was proposed by Alexander Hamilton, and that was an American monarchy. It was to create a strong, powerful, but almost monarchical president. And uh, in a sense, Trump, because of his success, is aspired to. Mm. I can't think of a better word. Mm -hmm. But people both admire him and ignore the fact that he got there on the backs of thousands of people through his bankruptcy. So he hasn't got, <coughs> as you said, he's got no political experience. He says he's going to be the greatest jobs president. But, you know, where's the evidence? How's he going to back yeah. it up? What exactly. happens if he Exactly. Is there not an element of desperation in these voters? I mean, it's something like desperate. 49% of them say they're angry at the establishment, the federal government. 40% of them, people who vote for Trump, say they feel betrayed by the Republican Party. Yeah. Who else are they going to vote for? Another oh, vanilla yeah. moderate candidate? Yeah, they have Cruz, but Trump has managed through his persona, megalomania, to offer them an even further outside the box um, well, well, keep in well, mind that Cruz is the only senator who has the full backing of the Tea Party faction. Now, this is an interesting situation. Should be co-opted, though. Well, keep in mind, though, this is an interesting situation for the Republican Party because something like 18% of the American population uh, associates themselves with the Republican themselves with the Republican Party, but over 50% associate themselves with the Tea Party faction. So the Republican Party is not very positive and, about the. And Tea I Party. don't know that I would call Senator Cruz the. Did you say moderate candidate? No, no, I wouldn't call him moderate. He's not yeah. even vaguely they, they, moderate, they, they, and he's not established. The Republicans have rejected all of the yes, moderates. Yes, And they're not two opportunities of anti-establishment candidates. And, and it hits to one of the other themes that I think that we should mention today is about, and, and Dan and I were talking about this beforehand, is about what an odd system the U.S. has. And, and so I think people in the states are, you were talking about primary caucuses, super delegates, not super delegates, bounded delegates. You know, it's, it's a, a lengthy process. And um, there's different rules for every state. And if you're, and, and it's left some voters feeling disenfranchised and even, you know, probably feeding into the Trump phenomenon because they feel like their vote doesn't count, that it's a rigged system. And keep in mind that the Republican National Convention 
if there is not a clear, and that is very clear front runner, at the, at the first vote, could go into hundreds of votes because delegates are only pledged for that first vote. And then trading begins. Offers begin. Sorry. Sorry, I just need to get, we've got an interesting <laughs> question from Paul here. He says, what can we New Zealanders do online or otherwise to best help the anti-Trump efforts? <laughs> <laughs> You can through PayPal if you have funding to people like Bernie Sanders and other candidates. Yeah. Well, not a oh, time. You have to have a not free time. Time. No, but you can have a free New Zealand American citizen give them money and then they can give it to an anti-Trump candidate. I understand. Through PayPal, I understand. And talking about Sanders, I guess we have to give the um, Democrats a bit of a look in here. Um, Linda, I guess if we look to you now, we've got Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders. Do you think the states are ready for a, a woman president? Oh, well, uh, but if I just go back to Trump and then <laughs> maybe just get him out of the way for a little bit. Um, it's particularly interesting at the moment when we do have Trump and he's getting this, uh, this the anti-establishment followers um, and he's um, appealing to some of the things that you reminded us about in the start, Eva, about those people who have fears about their kind of national security, fears about their livelihoods and so on. So he really plays, in, plays into that. But he also plays into not just, you know, racism or um, um, class issues, but he definitely plays into sexism and homophobia. Mm -hmm. So we know we know that he's um, been saying some appalling things about women. He's frequently cited as um, being abusive to women journalists. Um, even if he likes them, rather than answering their question, he'll say, you are beautiful. Mm -hmm. So he diminishes their authority by calling them into their bodily being by saying, mm -hmm. this is what I think about you just through appearance. So. Trump is the misogynist, the, the great misogynist here, and that allows other folk to also uh, to be misogynists as well. And then you get this kind of following where they let their prejudice come to the fore. And that's a difficult situation to be in for Hillary Clinton. Well, yes and no, it can be to her advantage. But with Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton, we've got a really interesting um, fight, if you like, going on there around gender as well, because Bernie can be very vivacious, outspoken, really um, at his rallies, you see him there, you know, going like this and thrashing the table and calling everyone, you know, to, um, to get behind him. But when Hillary Clinton is outspoken and starting to raise her voice, she gets a lot of negative um, attention. By, by the media and by others saying she's shouting, she's too shrill. So her, her authority gets diminished by the very voice that she uses. Whereas the male candidates can be very, um, very varied in their responses to, um, to, their, to, to, the, to the voters, to the audiences. So we have a really interesting race there. So, you know, Clinton, if she is to be the first female pro, uh, president in the US, um, is she able to be really transformative in her campaign? Well, Bernie Sanders, can't, he's undermining that with his own personality. So she really doesn't have that kind of transformative um, following yet. But, you know, if she's still got Trump to run against, if she gets through, then that could work in her favour because we know that Trump is um, not just upsetting women in general, but upsetting Republican women. Republican women. And, and so I was heartened by that, about that that seemed to be when he finally started to lose traction, is that that was the line. It was the line with women. And I, and I think that Republican women came out and, and, and vocalized mm -hmm. that this is not all right, where this, you've, you've crossed a line. And his support started to diminish you know, for the first time. And then um, also, so he had his wife come out to speak on his behalf. Yes. I don't know that that was yeah. so successful, but uh, no, they it started, an interesting um, tactic. Um, my wife's better than your yeah. wife. Yeah. Kind of right. that we right. I, I really don't think we've seen the Republican candidate yet. For president. No. So is that because I suspect you think it it'll might be contested. somebody like Paul Ryan. Who oh. Oh. Are you going to tell the entire, everyone that voted in the primary Elections, though, that their voters were nothing. They've done that many times in the past. But now in the media echo chamber there today, I could just see this being 
And well, the, strategic. The, problem, the problem with Cruz and Trump, who are the vast winners of votes, is that neither of them are very acceptable to the Republican mm -hmm. Party. Mm -hmm. And Kasich is a minor figure as far as votes so far. And Ryan is Speaker of the House of Representatives and has, like Napoleon, refused to crown a couple of times before he accepted it. But for me, uh, although Bernie Sanders has received a lot of small donations, and it's great that he's had so many, uh, big money is going to Hillary Clinton. That's right. So, Dan, on that, that's one of the Facebook questions that um, I want to ask. So, for, um, Michael says <coughs> that um, that Senator Sanders, Sanders has broken uh, records in small donations, mm -hmm. uh, and and that his question is: Is it possible that this could be a new standard expectation for future candidates? Is this a sign that big money is going to go out of campaigns? Well, uh, <laughs> actually. Uh, the thing about uh, campaign donations, uh, the small donations can be used to support, directly support uh, Bernie Sanders' campaign. But because of the nuances of funding elections, PACs, as you are very familiar, political action committees, allow unlimited donations by single contributors to try to defeat particular candidates. This is a loophole in the laws. The Koch brothers, spelled K-O-C-H, who are ultra-conservative, but who support same-sex marriage and a lot of other uh, progressive causes, have shifted their funding this year to Hillary Clinton. Usually they support ultra-right-wing causes. Uh, they're against anything that looks like response to climate change, but they work very closely with Obama for some reason. They've now shifted their funding to Hillary Clinton. Uh, their ability to defeat a candidate is far, far greater than Bernie Sanders' little $25 donations. Mm -hmm. And I would like to think that small donations will somehow change the face of U.S. elections. But this is going to be another 3 or $4 billion election. And it's the big money that's going to make a difference. You can, you can have more money coming in from the rich billionaires because of this insurgency of small donations. Right. So, Ruben, since uh, I, so Linda's talked about the impact mm -hmm. on women. I'm I'm kind of curious about your view on the international implications of this election. What 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 are you seeing as the implications mm -hmm. of how it's developed so far? Well, the, we go with the front runners and start with Trump. Yep already a large chunk of the Republican foreign policy establishment have already come out and repudiated him. They're already saying in their discussions with officials overseas that uh, American credibility and predictability is already in question and it's already undermining Americans' interests, the fact that he's gotten where he's got to. If you look at, if you step, step back and look at what Trump says, the clearest articulation you have is um, his recent interviews with the New York Times a week or so ago, in which he kind of blow by blow goes through different parts of the world. <coughs> he, he calls it America first, right? So he's not isolationist, but in every single case, East Asia, the Middle East, NATO alliance, keeping Japan and South Korea secure and so on, everything comes down to what does America get out of it. If there's a treaty with Japan, Japan should have to pay a bit more for that treaty. It's like a protection racket, right? The mafioso comes into town, talks to the person in the dairy and says, give me, more, you know, give me money and I'll protect you. Uh, the free trade agreements, he says he doesn't reject free trade, but he talks about fair trade, basically renegotiating those for better terms for America. So, so, I'm, so just even listening to you, I can just tell you that a lot of Americans would hear that and say, well, what's wrong, what's wrong with, with that? that? That sounds good Isn't to me. What happens that, now? That don't, we want <laughs> American, don't we want our president to put American interests first? And well, you can think about like a CEO and they're his, um, you know, that they, they own all the stocks in his company, the shareholders, and he's doing the best for them. So I can completely see that point of view from their point of view. I guess, though, we have this idea in the world now of a rules-based system of some form of equality, trade agreements that you know should benefit us and you somewhat equally, but it sounds to me he wants it to benefit mm. them more than you. And you can understand that. Can't you? Yeah. Well, just um, if we get a bit more parochial, Eric says he's relatively new to New Zealand. How important are these elections to New Zealand? Mm -hmm. um, and what are the implications specifically for New Zealand if Trump does happen to? Well, 
I mean, I think there's two things. He, again, everything is about getting more for America and Trump's view. So it could very well be, well, okay, America, New Zealand, you, you, you kind of, we kind of have a de facto alliance with Americans at the moment. We don't have a security treaty that says they guarantee our security if something goes wrong, but it's kind of implicit under the surface. Well, we do have a treaty. It's we called the major non-NATO military alliance. 1998. Yeah, but it's not a collective security treaty on the, on no. the order of NATO. But I'd like to imagine him pretty, pretty much saying to New Zealand, well, look, we're going to renegotiate the TPP, and you're going to, you're going to suck it up, and it's going to allow less access for you into, into our country, maybe more for us into New Zealand, who knows. You know, put up your defence budget, uh, send more troops overseas to fight in our interventions, you know, our, large, our largest army deployment at the moment is already in Iraq, it's not really talked about these days, but that's, mm -hmm. that's where our last foreign military deployment is, well, he might just say, okay, well, we want more of those. We want your defense, defense budget to be bigger. We're going to renegotiate the TPP. You can't do anything about it. So I think I think we may end up paying, if, if, he, if he actually take him at his word, we will might end up doing more for the Americans in terms of what suits their strategic interests. And, of course, we say indirectly that suits us because it, you know, we're under a sort of security umbrella. I disagree with you a little bit. <laughs> Uh, I think it will be similar to George W. Bush. We don't know what this person is going to do because he's, I don't want to say a moron, but he has, he's, no he has no credibility. It will depend on who he appoints. Who's, who's and the, he is ripe to be captured. Yeah. Whoever ends up being appointed will capture that part of Trump. And just to support that, he said to the New York Times, a key part of his foreign policy is unpredictability. He doesn't want other countries to know what he's going to do before he does it. So we well, have an answer. We don't know. What about on the Democratic side? So you have, yeah, sure. you know, you have um, yeah. um, Hillary Clinton, former Secretary of State, travel, yeah. well-traveled, uh, good international oh, credibility, Senator Sanders. Except we have to look to a, a key article in Atlantic in February called the Obama Doc. And after a careful analysis of Obama's realist foreign policy, which is really enlightening, I think New Zealand got the very best deal we could have possibly got from Obama. Yeah. I don't think I we're going to find a better president on the horizon yeah. for New Zealand's uh, foreign policy. We had a rapprochement of unprecedented uh, value. We almost have resurrected ANZUS. Uh, we've got uh, sympathies that I never expected to see within a two-year period. But part of that is the, is the relationship that's been built. I mean, I, that's don't right. You think with the, the Wellington and, Declaration, yeah. mm -hmm. but a lot of it had to do with Obama because of his pivot to Asia and because of the value that he gave to New Zealand for. We don't know why, but exactly, but we have some indication. So, so can that be maintained? So, yeah, so I was going to say... Well, I don't think it can be maintained with any of the candidates that we see right now on the horizon. We need another realist. So, Ruben, would political you agree realist. with that? I, I would pretty much basically agree with that. Um, and then Obama Doctrine article does outline his worldview very well, and it does suit New Zealand well. It's, it's very non-ideological, so not picking fights over... Differences, right? The, and New Zealand's anti nuclear policy, for example, was not an issue with Obama in any significant form. Clinton, He's willing to forego the problems that led to the USS Buchanan's rejection. Yeah. So, this is in the Atlantic Monthly or the Atlantic Magazine in February, and it is a must read article to understand exactly that question. But I think that, again, we haven't seen an emerging candidate yet, and when we look at, in that article, Hillary's, Hillary Clinton's proposed foreign policy and the way in which Obama moderated her foreign policy time and time again, I think that Hillary Clinton would have been much harder on New Zealand mm -hmm. and much harder on a lot of other countries as well, would have probably bombed Damascus. And uh, yeah, she's, she's voiced support for more funds to the Syrian rebels, yeah. to yeah. Um, even the 2008 uh, <coughs> Green Revolution uprising against the Iranian mullahs. He, she said she wished um, America intervened more there. Um, yeah, across the board, 
many issues in the Middle East, she says America would intervene more, provide more support. When, when I think of a woman making a difference in U.S. politics, I think of the first woman elected to Congress from the, my state of Montana, Jeanette Rankin. She was first elected in 1916, and she was one of a very few women to vote against entry to World War I. She was immediately defeated for Congress after that. And then she didn't get back into the House of Representatives until just before World War II, and she was the only member of Congress to vote against U.S. entry into World War II. So, obviously, she was, and she was defeated right after that. Mm -hmm. uh, they are in for two years. I was just going to say, Linda, I, I, I want to hear from you. You're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't. Yeah. So, if you come out fighting as a woman candidate and say, I'm fighting, and say, so we will increase our expenditure, or we will do this, or we will bond Damascus, and so on, then you get. You, you stay know, in power. Well, well, maybe not as a woman, but you would as a man, perhaps. But as a woman, if you say, no, I'm not going to do that, they say, oh, she's too weak. Mm -hmm. She's and they, not the strong features, enough. And yeah. then she's out. I, I think you're so right. So Jeanette Rankin was a very courageous woman, the first woman elected to the U.S. Congress, but she was only in for two two-year terms mm -hmm. because she took a courageous stand against war. Mm -hmm. is, is there a risk of overcompensation to make up for this you know, um, view that women are sort of weak, mm. that Clinton could espouse a more muscular foreign policy, even take mm. steps that maybe someone else wouldn't, because she's worried about that, do you think? Uh, I don't know. You... It's a fine balance to play, and she, for the most part, in her run-up to the election, has not been talking about herself as a woman. She's tried to avoid that, as if she could be gender neutral, almost. But sometimes she's used it to call for some support when Bernie Sanders has been saying, you know, you're too shrill, or you're, you're shouting too much about arms, and so forth. So, you know, we look at all the other woman leaders that we've had in the world, and we can think of people like... The Iron Lady, Margaret Thatcher. Golden my hair. Yes, yes, we, and we, we know the kind of reception that our own Prime Minister Helen Clark had about how you take a hard line or you don't, and then you, you get um, you get told that you're too weak for the position and you get rolled in that respect. So it's always a juggling act for these women leaders mm -hmm. about how to then make their foreign policy and then enact it. She the is clearly getting women's votes, though, in the U.S. right now. Mm -hmm. And she will probably overcome a lot of the negative vote mm -hmm. with her natural advantage there. Mm -hmm. So, But I fear that her patterns of, her belligerent patterns will continue as president. Mm -hmm. So the next big primary is Tuesday. It's New York, law at stake. Uh, the Senator Sanders um, and Hillary Clinton going going head to head, and um, Donald Trump uh, and Senator Cruz as well. And so, any thoughts about how it's going to play out? And I don't want you to look in your crystal ball or anything. But, uh, just the the um, aspects of New York that's been different from the rest of the primaries going forward. What's Boy, didn't we have a mayor of New York come out in support of Trump recently? Ex mayor. Um, I can, um, yeah, the, the governor of oh, New Jersey. Jersey. Chris Christie. Chris Chris okay. Christie, yeah. No, Chris Christie is governor. New Jersey. Yeah. 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 Got He's, uh, Chris Christie is deeply embroiled still in scandal because of his, uh, his official's diversion of traffic uh, across a bridge. So, yes, but what about, what about New York? What about New York? <laughs> well, <laughs> I, 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 will, I will go through the crystal ball. Yeah, yeah, I'll just look at the yeah. polls. Okay, well, and apparently um, Trump and Clinton are ahead by double digits. Trump by 33% at the moment, apparently. But, of course, he's, he's essentially on there. He's a Trump big real towers. estate guy. Trump Towers. So he's, he must have some home base there. He's created jobs there, so on and so forth. So I think that's a lot. I hate to say it because the polls have been wrong a few times. It has been. That's, an, that's another interesting feature of this, is that the, it's, it's how wrong the polls have been. And, and so there's a degree of skepticism when you say it, that you even added that caveat is, is an indication of, of how the polls have not quite indicated. And I, I wonder why that is. I'm not, I'm not sure what the... Trump looks to be behind in Pennsylvania, though, mm. which is, if anything, more mm. important for him than New York. He has been counting on New York. So why do you say Pennsylvania is more important than New York? Well, because he had New York in the bag. Yeah. 
But Pennsylvania yeah. is one of those states that he has swing to capture. To the, For yeah. him, it becomes a swing yeah. state in the yeah. primaries because he has to capture 40% or more, according to Silver, mm -hmm. in order to maintain his track to getting the and, requisite number. And Trump had Wisconsin in the bag until about two weeks beforehand. He's his, and you know, his abortion <laughs> comments, I think, you know, Trump continued to say just belligerent comment after comment yeah. and comment, get away with it. Yeah. And I think there may have been a slight turning point a couple weeks ago when he made those abortion comments yes. that are outside the mainstream on both the Democratic and actually most of the Republican yeah. side. Yeah. And Wisconsin, may, I, I can't say that was causing So do you think that collateral damage will follow him to Pennsylvania or is he going to... So, so some people have said that in business he's been very good at exploiting the rules. This goes back to the process right. again. Yeah. And that he has not quite gotten the primary process and he hasn't it's done... fantastic at short-term decision-making, mm -hmm. yeah. less so yeah. medium yeah. to long-term strategic yeah. decision-making. Yeah. Even the fact that he'd come out with these comments, I mean, why doesn't he just pivot to the center? Mm. I'm a born, you know, I'm, I'm a new man, and bring, get his wife out more. Get a bit of a charm offensive going on, but he's not doing it. And so you just wonder, well, what's, yeah, what advice is he? probably won't take advice. No, no, no. And that's the worry of him to be president, <laughs> that he wouldn't take advice. Look, I, I'm not sure what would Well, he will, though. He'll have to yeah, as yeah. president. If he gets in. He doesn't have time, though. I, I don't know what will happen in New York, but I was just in San Francisco um, a couple of weeks ago, yeah. and getting the feel through the media there and talking to folk about what they thought about this. And I picked up a magazine, People magazine, um, popular magazine, which um, starts on the title page, Who is the real Donald Trump? As if there was something behind this. <laughs> um, and it says, he's volatile, savvy, and some say scary. People talks to friends and foes about Trump, plus how he really feels about women. Yeah. So there's still this brand that's going on mm -hmm. yeah. that he's, you know, he's. Well, let's look at him. Let's see if he is a new man or, um, or not. But um, according to this um, article, which also has some more interesting photos of the man himself going. It made there. his hand look bigger than it really is. <laughs> yeah, it's really big. He's looking very threatening there. He requested that. Yeah. yeah. There's wonderful comb over that. It's his trademark <coughs> as well. Here it, it does show that the, the level of support is high for someone who wants to be that outsider, you know, who can make a lot of money. And that's where a lot of the votes are coming from. What about issues of race? I was, um, Michael's come up with a question. No, sorry, Scott. Um, um, why does Clinton have the African-American vote when Sanders' policies are likely to help them more? Um, well, and, it, and we've had, of course... That's Trump. not actually true. Uh, the African-American vote is hiving off to some extent to Sanders right now. It's not clearly to Clinton, but uh, Clinton, uh, as the first lady of Arkansas, uh, was schooled in a lot of uh, very important policies that had to do with African Americans. Um, I think that she, growing up in Chicago as a Republican, she was uh, very aware of the policies that affect African Americans, and she has uh, been involved in that. But at the same time, I think she's very vulnerable to a switch by the final election because Bernie Sanders is. But um, sorry, a switch from her from her to who? To Bernie. To Bernie, yeah. Um, and depending on who the Republicans come up with in the general election, she could be vulnerable there as well, although I can't imagine a Republican candidate who would out-poll her with African Americans. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can't. So one thing yeah. I've noticed just as a difference from the um, American uh, psyche and the New Zealand psyche is that, and this came up with the Google Hangouts when the students were asked who they would support. Everybody loves Bernie. You know, it's yeah, the, his, right. his policies make well. sense, and I think yeah. because the the social welfare system in this country is so more closely aligned to what he's advocating, and it's considered to be a little bit more radical uh, in, the, oh, in the U.S. but not one policy of his. Right. States' rights for guns. Hmm. He is a strong supporter of states' rights for gun legislation, 
and that is just beyond the pale. So hey, I think it was two days ago that the Kerry Law went into effect in Texas, 50 years after the first big campus shooting, and the University of Texas is now advising its lecturers not to avoid controversial subjects because their students are allowed to carry concealed handguns in their backpacks. Uh, some of the states, my state of Montana, have the most incredible gun legislation. Montana has a castle law that allows you to kill but, somebody but in your you, home if you feel threatened. But have you heard a lot of, of that has not been the focus of this no, debate yeah. so it far, has, has it? It, it really has. Ha so I'm not discounting that. I'm just saying that it doesn't seem it like it's gotten, through. it hasn't come through. I mean, I, I don't no, think No, because has. the NRA is so powerful and has so much legislation going in various forms that it's almost death for anybody to talk about it. Back to the issue quickly of um, young people supporting dirty. Yeah, yeah. It's the same with Obama though, wasn't it? Yes. Young yeah. people at the moment mm -hmm. will coalesce around exciting, like energetic, yeah, different, yeah. energetic, and you know, within liberal, within the, in the Democratic Party, you have a big segment of liberals, but you know how a lot more people this election than the last calling themselves very liberal. So even within the Republican establishment and the Democratic establishment, you're getting greater, larger proportions on each fringe. Mm -hmm. And these are the people that will next. So there's like. that. So that's an interesting point because there is, yes, on the fringes, but what and, and this is what the primaries don't capture. There's also that growing segment of Americans who consider themselves independents. And independents aren't oh, it depends on the state by state system, aren't always allowed to vote in the primaries. And so we're not really getting that sense of where the independents are, who they're yeah. Independents can vote in the primaries because they're all open states. primaries. It depends on the state. Well, there are it's very awesome. few closed primaries. Almost every primary, you just walk into the polling place and ask for a Democratic or Republican uh, uh, ballot. Paul says Almost everyone. But the further is the long primary electoral process and strange party delegate system <laughs> based system part of the problem here. The problem is, is how it will be fixed is by whoever wins, and it's really not in that that whoever wins is probably doesn't have the vested interest to fix it, and so that's how it keeps going on and on. And I just don't know that that's gonna, it, even though people have looked at it and said in, in more detail, I think than than ever before, and said what a what an odd system that we have. But it's who's gonna change it. How would that actually be changed? Mm. You'd have to have a yeah. cross-partisan consensus to do it. Yeah. As we know at the moment, America is incredibly polarized. Yeah. They can't agree on the most basic right. things because they're scared that they do so the other side will get some political benefit and they won't, you know? And that's indicated by the, the candidates that we have right now. So, you know, as we said, Trump clearly an anti-establishment, but Senator Cruz also is not embraced by the Republican Party in any sense of the word. He's not a mainstream candidate. Um, Senator Sanders, who didn't even call himself a Democrat in 2012. That's right. And and then um, probably he called himself prob a socialist. Probably Hillary Clinton mm -hmm. is the the closest to someone who, yeah. um, and I'm not advocating for a one word, but is is probably the one who is the most establishment kind of she's candidate. She's very establishment. Yeah, mm -hmm. she yeah is. she's she is. right down the middle. Yeah. The. Uh, I but mean, that's I worry as far as building it's worried, seeds. Right? It's a worry yeah. about building because you know it from the international right. perspective, yeah. to, to get things done, you need to build coalitions. It can't that's be just one party right. or the other party. It has, it has to, to be, be a coalition. A uh, coalition is the, is the key to a democratic society because people don't think the same. Uh, and that's why I think somebody like Paul Ryan, who is very conservative, but who has nonetheless played, the rule, played by the rules and in the House of Representatives uh, is a, a more likely candidate than anybody else. Not Kasich, Kasich, yeah. Well, Kasich is kind of not really charismatic or well-known. Mm -hmm. Paul Ryan, um, maybe. We should make sure that we cover the what do people think is going to happen. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to leave without that. Um, many argue that Hillary Clinton leads the Democratic primaries over Bernie Sanders because 
the mainstream media have helped her get there. This is a question from Rosanna. Mm. Why is it then a candidate like Donald Trump, who is clearly anti an anti-establishment candidate, thrives in the Republican primaries? So he, he's saying that CNN have pushed the establishment mm. agenda. Do you think that's right? Mm. Well, Trump's great on TV, isn't he? Because he mm. just opens his mouth and something comes out and people uh, react. So you get a lot of audience when you put Donald Trump in front of the camera. And he loves that. He loves to grandstand mm. in that way and make outrageous remarks. Mm. So, you know, the media does follow that and he has been in the long run because of it. And Clinton? And Clinton, yeah, well... Has she been supported by major media institutions? Well, probably. Look, she comes from a, the Clinton family and she comes from that background mm -hmm. of knowing how to work with that media to be in the to be in the spotlight. And she's the and she's partner of an impeached president. That's right. And then she's got her partner <laughs> as well. Forget. When she, and no one would ever forget that because that she always has to carry that with her. Yeah. Um, what, what, I was in the US a few weeks ago, so this is anecdotal, but I found that the media overall was quite good at being giving a balanced both pro and negative view of the candidates. Do you just sit there, I just sit in my hotel room and jump between Fox News, yes, CNN, yeah. MSNBC? Yeah. If I watch any single one of them, I would have no real view of any, I'd have yeah, a yeah, view of What about right. your geographic location? Where were you in it the It was States? Atlanta. Okay. And, and what was kind of the mood in Atlanta? Everyone was in denial about Trump. Everyone said, he can't win, there's no way. Um, and I, 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 so I said, well, hold on, we were saying this six months ago, I look where he is now. Um, well, I, when I was in the San Francisco a couple of weeks ago, I went to a basketball game and there was t-shirts for sale, current for president in the San Francisco <laughs> NBA, so I'm not that would be it's the first the first day of classes. My students were whispering in the back, <laughs> and finally I said, you know, what's what's going on? We want to ask you how could how did Donald Trump get here? You know, it's just really it's uh, uh, it is it's what, a puzzle. One final point on the money. On, on the media helping or hindering candidates. It's forty percent of Americans in a poll last year said they no longer trust the mainstream media. Sixty percent of Republicans don't trust the mainstream media. 30% of Democrats don't trust the mainstream media. Mm. So even a lot of the stuff going on in the mainstream media, for almost half Americans now, they, they either just ignore it or they don't believe it and think so it can be a lie. Is, is social media a factor in this election? That's, you know, has it been part, we're doing a Google Hangouts, this is a good, good question to ask. <laughs> Has social media, is that where people are getting their, their media? I think the people that are supporting Trump probably wouldn't know social media if it hit them on the behind, <laughs> really. <laughs> but I think what I've seen, uh, these are disadvantaged, mostly uh, white. Uh, people are uninformed as well. They're misinformed. Yeah. They're yeah. misinformed. Yeah. So what does that look like? What, what does that mean, though? What do you, when you say that? That means if you tell someone that, a pro-Trump supporter, that um, the, the leader of the Ku Klux Klan like, supports them or something like that, they'll say, well, I, I don't, either I don't believe that, or I bet if I go and Google KKK and Clinton, a picture will come up showing that some KKK member supports her as well. It's kind of a re you raise, around reality. You raise an interesting point because in the 1990s, David Duke, a grand wizard of the Ku Klux Klan and a member of the one of the American Nazi parties, uh, got the nomination for governor of Louisiana. Uh, there, the there's no party discipline in the United States, so the Republicans were saying, "Well, he's not one of us," but he was on the ballot as the Republican nominee for governor. Uh, Edwin Edwards, who was the Democrat, was under indictment for corruption, and he later went to federal prison. But uh, um, they had to have a, an election with a Ku Klux Klan leader, who incidentally supports Donald Trump right now. He's endorsed Donald Trump. And the bumper stickers all said, vote for the crook. It's important. <laughs> because uh, they didn't have a choice. They either voted for the crook or they voted for a white supremacist. Mm. To Professor Zerker's point on coalitions, this is from Angus, has the primary highlighted the weakness of the Republican coalition? Can social conservatives, small business owners and big businesses coexist within the same party or do we, ideally, need to see the formation of new smaller parties? Well, new smaller parties do emerge in the United States from time to time 
the last time that a smaller party uh, became a bigger party was in 1858. So it doesn't, <laughs> happen, it doesn't happen very often. That's when the Whigs became the modern Republican Party. Uh, typically, these smaller uh, third parties uh, last for one or maybe two elections. The, the uh, Progressive Party in 1924. Uh, but it's very, very difficult because in a first-past-the-post system, uh, two parties typically remain the way they are. But you're absolutely right. Uh, coalitions are very difficult when you have great big uh, financial interests and small interests, and then you have what are called horizontal coalitions. And, you know, they just don't work very well. You have bullying. You have big, big capital and small people, and it, it's just not a very democratic system. But keep in mind, uh, one of the big fears of the founders of the United States, as encapsulated in Madison's Federalist Paper Number 10, was the fear of democracy. So that's why the too much the, democracy. Too much democracy. So the well, democracy in general. I mean, Madison was very clear: democracy was a danger. The republic was threatened by democracy. So uh, that's why the American people do not vote directly for the President of the United States. Mm -hmm. They vote for 538 electors, and it's possible that 37 percent of the American people can elect a President of the United States, and that 60-some percent can vote for a loser. It's what Scott says here, how inclusive to all voters is the American election system if the population only chooses one of four possible demographic choices, and a winner takes all votes. Yeah. yeah. That's right. It's winner take all in all but two states, and those are winner take all in districts, Maine and Nebraska. And uh, if a uh, if somebody takes just a bare majority in the general election of the popular vote in California, New York, Florida, Ohio, Texas and loses by a landslide in the rest of the country, they win the election. And so even when Americans poll that they are willing to vote for a third party, that they're anxious to vote for a third party, they go into the ballot booth and they don't vote for a third party. So They, they would be throwing away their vote, basically. Right. But if you're on things, then, of course, they are throwing it away. So we have to get away from that mindset. Yeah. 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 The other yeah. thing you have to keep in mind, and this happens in New Zealand, it happens in a lot of places, Many people vote against. Yeah, right. They go to vote right. against. That's right. That's right. That's true. And so you don't see very many creative mm -hmm. votes. So, well, just as a final exit, <laughs> I'd like to know <laughs> what way you think it's going to go. We'll start with you, Eva. <sighs> I say Hillary. I think it's going to be Hillary. That's my, I'm on the record. I think it's going to be. I think that she, that she knows the system the best. Mm. Uh, I think that she's uh, seen as the more moderate candidate. I think when it goes across the country, um, that she'll she'll be um, uh, well supported. So I vote. I, I, I suspect that it's going to be um, Hillary Clinton. That's my prediction. Mm. I suspect it will as well. If the Republicans go with Trump, it will. Mm. I'm. I feel it will be. Uh, Clinton to take the to be the first woman president in the US. She'll have a tough job. She'll have a tough job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she will. But I think it'll be her. Okay. Um, I think Clinton too. I think she's a weak candidate, but I think they're all weak candidates in this election. Uh, I mentioned earlier that 70% of Americans have an unfavorable of Trump. 55% had an unfavorable, an unfavorable view of Clinton as well. That's a big gap, 15%. Yeah. But still, a majority of Americans have an unfavorable yeah. view of Clinton as well. So she will probably be the, like, the lesser of two evils. To be slightly provocative, though, yeah. I think the best candidate to run against her for the Republicans is probably Trump. And we probably have to talk about this further. Because he's, <laughs> because, and I know we don't have time, but he's a chameleon and he will do and say anything. Yeah. He's not vanilla. If he wants, he does have a war chest of billions of dollars that he's not using. He's a cheapskate, which is partly why he's not doing better. 
If he chooses, you know, he he he, he can put he's on. He's running out of time. He is running out of time. He's running out of time. But I, I can't see any other Republican, maybe Paul Ryan, though, that has a shot of being Clinton at the moment. Exactly. Well, I I would prefer to see Clinton elected, but I have been unhappy with almost every election that I've gone by since 1968, particularly. And I'm expecting to be very unhappy with this election so who do you as well. Think is gonna get it? Well, I expect somebody that I don't want to win <laughs> because you, that has been my experience, <laughs> election after election after election. So do you think Clinton will get in? Well, I'm hoping that Clinton will get in. But you're in. the curse, right? So maybe you shouldn't hope should get in. Yeah. <laughs> no. Well, Hubert Humphrey. Well, the problem. There are a number of problems here, but um, if Trump does not get the nomination, he could well split the Republican vote. Yeah. And right. that would be yeah. a positive for Clinton. Yeah. If he does get the nomination, as you said, then I think Clinton is a shoe in. Yeah. Yeah. If but, but, but we we thought you know yeah, he left conventional we conventional yeah, rules six months ago that, and he continues to he disregard these That's rules. Right. Yeah. So as soon as we bring see the expectations so as soon as we bring back this rule book for the yeah. national election, I keep going, Well hold on, hold on. Are we yeah. just in denial? Are we, are we, I, do we I, have I, the I can't yeah. support Bernie Sanders because of his views on gun legislation. I think that <laughs> The personal safety and the freedom of Americans is directly jeopardized by all of these gun-toting crazies. And so, yeah, I think Hillary Clinton is by far the best, although I'm chastened by that Obama doctrine article in the Atlantic. So, Allison, you should weigh in. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, you know, just just put in what you're what you're just. No, I'm the objective outside. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Go on then. <laughs> No, I'd, I'd be going with Clinton yeah. at this point, but I, you know, I'm just watching closely just to see. I, I still don't understand how the whole system works, so this is being no enlightening. No Americans no don't like dynasties, no and uh, they don't. Li they didn't like the Bush dynasty. No, no one liked but he wasn't actually elected. Mm. We there are real questions about the Florida. Uh, election in the first mm -hmm. one, and real questions about the Ohio election in the second one, and they will not like a Clinton dynasty. Either. You know. And we have Bill working behind the scenes, I suspect. Well, <laughs> and he's not exactly yeah. behind the scenes, actually. <laughs> well, I'd like to thank you all for your participa participation today, Dan Zerger, Ruben Zeb, Linda Johnston, and Eva Collins, and thank you to people who sent in questions. I hope you've been enlightened by the debate, and if you haven't been enlightened, I hope you enjoyed it. So it just <laughs> <laughs> doesn't mean to say thank you for viewing, and good afternoon. Bye-bye.